Karthik Bappanad. I am the center head of uh, SciSec. Welcome to uh, today's webinar. We will get started now. Um, a few ground rules. Uh, all attendees to the webinar will be on mute by default. We will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions on the chat window and it will be responded after the completion of the presentation. We are also going to record this webinar and the recording will be uploaded on the SciSec YouTube channel. So you can always refer back to the video later if necessary. So this webinar is a part of a series that we launched in March under the title uh, Sam Gachadvam, May We All Progress Together. The objective is to cover different topics of security over the course of this series. We want to provide a conceptual overview in these webinars to the various aspects of security and hope this will kindle your interest to explore further. This is the seventh webinar in this series. The topic of today's webinar is secure multi-party computation. Next week, we will partner with Cisco again covering the topic of network security. We will open the registration for next week's webinar shortly. Uh, we, we have more such webinars lined up over the next few weeks and I hope you will find this series of webinars useful. Do let us know if you have any feedback as well as any ideas to share with us. So we also have an assessment arranged at the end of the webinar. Those who complete the assessment successfully will be provided a certificate. The link for the assessment will be shared at the end of the webinar. The assessment will be kept open for 60 minutes after the completion of the webinar. The questions are from the topic covered during the webinar itself. So you should not have too much difficulty in cracking this assessment. The threshold path mark for today's assessment is 10 out of the 15 questions. At the end of the assessment, you will also be asked to provide feedback on the webinar. Please provide your genuine feedback and rest assured the feedback will not have any bearing on the assessment. <laughs> Uh, but one limitation is that you need to have a Gmail ID to take this assessment. The certificate will be emailed to the Gmail ID you would have used to log into the assessment uh, in the next few days. Please make sure you provide your details accurately when taking the assessment because the certificate will be generated based on the details provided by you. Uh, please bear with us in case of any delays in sharing the certificates. Rest assured, those who have cleared the assessment will be provided the certificate by email. Let me now introduce the speaker for uh, today's webinar. It's great to have uh, Professor Arpita Patra from Indian Institute of Science with us today. Uh, Professor Patra specializes in uh, cryptography, focusing on theoretical and practical aspects of secure multi-party computation protocols. She received her PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, and held postdoctoral positions at University of Bristol, UK, ETH Zurich, Switzerland, and Aarhus University, uh, Denmark. Her research has been recognized with Young Scientist Platinum Jubilee Award from the National Academy of Sciences, India, Women Excellence Award by Science and Engineering Research Board of the Central Government, uh, Young Engineer Award by Indian National Academy of Engineering, and associateships with various scientific bodies such as Indian Academy of Sciences, the World Academy of Sciences. She's a council member of Indian Association for Research in Computing Sciences since December 2017. Now I will hand over to uh, Professor Patra to take you through the rest of the webinar. Uh, Professor Patra, uh, over to you. I'll stop sharing now.
Okay, you can make yourself the presenter and share your screen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. I think. Okay. So uh, thank you, Karthik, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this talk. And let's get started. Okay, so today's uh, topic is secure the uh, This is a branch of cryptography. Cryptography is uh, is becoming an increasingly important uh, part of our lives uh, as this century progresses. Now, over the last forty years, cryptography has uh, enriched the theory of computation tremendously. And uh, one of the ideas that it has given to the theory of computation is uh, secure computation, also popularly known as secure multi-party computation or MPC. Okay, and this is the topic of today. You have uh, heard about encrypting messages through encryption schemes. That's quite common. Today we'll be listening about how to compute uh, a function, how how to encrypt a function, or how to encrypt a circuit or computation. These are all equivalent. So let's start. Uh, before I start, I just want to mention that since I'm not aware of the exact composition of the uh, the audience, I kept it at very high level. Uh, it, it, it's uh, going to be a, a very basic talk and uh, very, very accessible. Uh, I hope and I'm sure that all of you will uh, get all the ideas that are described. And along the presentation, I will also, um, uh, along with this topic, I'm also going to introduce you um, a very, very fundamental um, primitive known as uh, gobble circuits, which lends a power to the very fast solution for MPC. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of history. So MPC was introduced back in 1982 by Andrew Yao, and it was one of the finest ideas for which um, Andrew Yao received the Turing Award in the year of 2000. Okay. So at the high level, MPC permits a collection of data owners to perform a collaborative collection together without anyone knowing anything about the input provided by the other, except what is derivable from the function output, which all of them wish to compute. Okay. So, so at a high level, MPC takes the emulates a trusted third party for all the data owners which takes the form of a uh, of a of, of an interactive algorithm to be run amongst those parties themselves okay little bit in detail in mpc there are n parties p1 to pn who are geographically apart but they are connected over a communication network assume that the parties are connect all the parties are connected to each other by pairwise uh, secure channel so everybody can talk to everybody else and now there is a centralized adversary the bad guy in cryptography so it's a centralized adversary and it corrupts p out of those in part and that is the ones which are not corrupted by the adversary have absolutely no clue about who are corrupt. So the identities of the corrupt parties are not known. Now, every party PI has a private input XI. And the goal, the common goal, all the in parties, is to compute an N input function F on their private inputs, X1 to XA. And in the end, the go goals are correctness, trust, uh, which means that all the parties would like to obtain the function output f 
evaluated on the uh, input sequence x1 to xn. Second, privacy. More than the function output should be. So notice that if correctness is the only requirement, then NC is very, very easy to uh, achieve. The parties can simply share the inputs with each other and uh, they themselves can locally compute the function output. There is no privacy concern at all. So it is the privacy property which makes NPC a very, very interesting, fascinating area of research. Typically, we consider two types of adversary. First, which is a simpler one, is semi honest. Here we are saying that the adversary uh, is. Uh, uh, Professor Patra, uh, sorry, yes. sorry for interrupting. Uh, your voice is breaking uh, 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 at times. I see. Audio is. So should I try with the mobile? Uh, okay, this is this probably became a bit better now. Let's try for try this for some time. If it's breaking again, I'll let you know. I see. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. So and and uh, uh, yes, let me is also known as what? That means it is the memories of the corrupt parties. All that the corrupt parties listens from the honest parties that it can listen and those information it can try to glean more information uh, no i think i think the voice is uh, voice is not uh, uh, good again uh, i think we probably have to switch to the mobile option for audio okay so i okay let me go maybe an issue i don't know yeah sorry about that no 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 okay so Sorry for the interruption. Uh, she should be back um, pretty soon. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, should I should I share the? I mean, should I start from the beginning? Ah, uh, probably can. Yeah, quickly summarize. Uh, you know, uh, this slide. You yeah, I think I'm here. just uh, just for this. I can repeat again. Uh, sure, sure. I think uh, the volume should be reduced a little. It is echoing. Can you repeat again? Could you lower the volume of your uh, mic? So that's pretty poor, is it? No, this is fine. I mean, it is. Uh, if you could lower a little bit because it is echoing. I see. But I'm not holding the mobile close to my mouth almost. 
I think that should be okay. You, you can you can proceed. I mean, this is fine. This is fine. Okay. So okay. So I'm going to start from the beginning. So how much was audible? Not nothing was audible, is it? Yeah, it was breaking uh, quite uh, repeatedly. Uh, so you know, uh, while we are able to follow, you know, it's uh, probably you know better to quickly uh, you know summarize again. Uh, no, you can you can start from the from the from that slide itself. Okay. Okay, so we'll start with a little bit of history on uh, on this problem of MPC. So it was introduced uh, uh, by Andrew Yao back in 1982, and uh, um, this is one of the finest ideas for which Yao had received a Turing Award in the year of 2000. So at a very high level, MPC permits a collection of data owners to perform a collaborative computation on their uh, private data. Uh, uh, in such a way that nothing is leaked about their private inputs, and uh, it is only the the output of the function which is known to them, right? So, in other words, MPC takes the form of an it emulates a trusted third party for the data owners, which takes the form of an interactive algorithm to be run amongst the data owners themselves. Okay, little bit in detail. Uh, in MPC, there are n parties denoted by P1 to Pn, who are geographically apart, but they are connected over a communication network. So assume that every pair of parties connected by a uh, private and secure channel, so everybody can talk to everybody else. Now assume that there is a centralized adversary who can corrupt P out of those n parties, and the honest parties. Have absolutely no clue about who are corrupt. Now, every party P I has a private input X I, and the goal of the parties P one to P N is to compute this uh, a, uh, a common N input function F on the private inputs of the parties, that is X one up to X N. Now, the goal of N P C is uh, our uh, first correctness. That is, uh, the parties would like to compute the function f on their private inputs, and secondly, privacy, which means that nothing more than the function output should be revealed. Now, what is that? If we have just the correctness requirement, then MPC is uh, a very easy problem to solve. It is the privacy requirement which makes uh, MPC a very challenging uh, problem. Now, typically, we consider two Kinds of adversaries. First is semi-honest, which is uh, a, a benign one. It's also called an eavesdropper. So here, the adversary would simply eavesdrop the the memories of the corrupt parties, the T corrupt parties. Okay, meaning that it receives or gets all the information that this T corrupt parties receive from the honest parties. And from these information, it would try to glean information about the Inputs of the honest parties. Okay, and now there is another extreme. Uh, it, 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 this this form of adversary is called malicious, also called active, and here the adversary can force the corrupt parties to behave in any arbitrary way. There is absolutely no limitation. So in any arbitrary way, the the parties under the control of the adversary can behave. So in this talk, I'm going to keep it very simple, and we will consider only any honest adversary. Okay. Now, since uh, in, uh, there is hardly any problem in cryptography which is not modeled by MPC, MPC is called as the standard bearer and holy grail problem. So you give me any problem in cryptography, and it can be modeled and abstracted as an MPC problem. So MPC is a very very powerful abstraction. Okay, so as I have mentioned before, Andrew Yao is the is the is the father of this area. He has initiated this problem back in 1982 in his uh, foundational work published in uh, POX, which is uh, in the best conference in theory of computation. And the problem with which he motivated MPC is known as Yao's millennials problem. So let me explain that problem. Let me start with that motivational uh, scenario where MPC can be useful. 
So the problem is called Yao's millionaire problem. Uh, but if we have to be consistent with the pictures that I have put here, we have to uh, probably rename the problem as Yao's billionaire's problem. But never mind. So the problem goes as follows: There are two millionaires, and uh, they have their uh, assets. Of course, they are, the assets are private. The first person have uh, X crores and the second person have Y crores and they are interested in knowing who is richer between them. Without leaking their private assets to each other or in the public. Right? So the goal is to know who is richer between them without leaking their private assets to each other. So MPC perfectly fits in the scenario and can solve this problem. Today, the, uh, the, the application of MPC is not limited to Yao's millennials problem, but it can actually tackle myriad applications in real life. So let me give you uh, uh, several examples. So in fact, MPC is uh, going to turn one of the most impactful and disruptive technologies of, of this century by allowing cryptographically secure data analysis over sensitive data, which are split across various sources, and by bringing in significant social benefits in context where data sharing is constrained or prevented by legal, ethical, or privacy restrictions. Let me give uh, let me give you some examples. First, few uh, in last year, in fact, MPC has been used to do secure data analysis over sensitive salary data of 10 million people in greater Boston area to compute pay disparity. So if we ask for the salary data from various companies or even from individuals, they will, will not be really comfortable in sharing them because salary data is something which people consider as private data. But when they say that, uh, that um, when we say that we're going to use MPC, which is a privacy preserving technique, then all the companies actually came forward and they, uh, they did a secure data analysis on the salary data using MPC protocol. And the result was mind boggling. It has been found out that there is serious pay disparity, uh, gender disparity in terms of uh, salary, not just gender, but also skin color. Okay, these are very, very revealing facts. Second application, we can use MPC to train a machine learning model on private medical data held by several sources to offer the best treatment for diseases such as uh, HIV or in the, in the current time you can think about uh, uh, for COVID-19 for instance, you use lungs images. And again here there are privacy concerns because the hospitals are not supposed to disclose uh, the private medical data of the of the patients. But if we use MPC, there is guarantee of privacy of those individual data held by the hospitals. But uh, but we can still train a model which accesses the the database which is jointly held by all the all the hospitals. Okay, and as you know that uh, the machine learning gives robust models only when you have access to a huge amount of data. So the data is the nutrient for machine learning. The more data you have, the more robust model you can build. Right? Again, using MPC, we can actually build such uh, robust model. Third, you can um, consider uh, computing the probability of two satellites colliding in the space for satellites owned by competing countries. You can think of uh, India and China, and uh, let's uh, assume that they have uh, their satellites in the space, and the exact orbital information of those satellites, the private information, they're private to the individual countries, they cannot be leaked. And yet, they're interested, the countries are interested in, uh, in knowing if the satellites uh, uh, would be colliding with each other or not because building satellites is extremely expensive uh, and therefore they have uh, the, the joint interest of saving their satellites from, from collision. Again, we can use MPC so the countries can use their own private orbital information of the satellites as, as their private input 
to a function which can compute uh, which can compute uh, uh, the probability of collision and uh, like this there are plenty of other examples and a real, very real life uh, application of MPC has happened several years ago in Denmark it's a national wide secure option to find a fair price for sugar bit again here they have used MPC other applications include uh, implementing online sexual assault report, reporting platform or to find a secure intersection of a flyers list of a Slide and an international register of no flyers list, and then to detect hate speech and so on and so forth. There are many, many examples I have given you just few in order to motivate you and just to uh, uh, just to say you that yes, MPC is a very, very important problem and and in need of the moment for many applications that are needed. Now that we are motivated uh, with this problem, let's see how we solve this problem. What are the ways we can uh, deal with this problem? So one easy way to solve MPC is, is to have a trusted third party. So if there was some entity who everybody can trust, right? then it's very easy to solve uh, MPC problem. Everyone can simply hand over their inputs through a private channel to the TT trusted third party, aka TTP, and the TTP can simply compute the function output and hand over the output to everybody else. Right? This is the, the best solution, the ideal solution that you can think of. The trusted third party takes care of everything. But in reality, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the this is the solution. So parties give input, the TTP computes the output, sends it back to the uh, parties. But TTP exists only in fairy tales. We don't have trusted third party in real life. Even though we have, then we have to pay a huge price. And apart from that, the obvious problem with TTP is that it creates a single point failure. That is. If somehow the TTP can be infected by the adversary, right, then the, the, uh, the privacy of the inputs of all the parties are simply lost, of, of, of the honest parties are simply lost. And the goal of MPC is exactly that. Don't trust someone uh, centrally. Okay? Instead of that, let's distribute the trust amongst the parties. So the goal of uh, MPC, or in this case it's, it's 2PC, is to, is to design an interactive protocol which will be run between these two parties and it will emulate the same impact that, uh, that, that a TTP creates in the ideal world, in the ideal solution that I have given you. Okay? This is very informal, but in effect what I want to say is that even in, in the in the um, in the world where we are running a protocol, we are running a protocol. We are running a protocol. This protocol is going to leak exactly the same information that a TTP-based solution would have leaked. Right? In the TTP-based solution, as you can see, the only information that is leaked to the party that is it. Right? Even though the first party, let's say Alice is craft, it learns its own input x and the final output which is f of x, y which is handed uh, over by the TTP and that is it. We want to emulate the same impact even using this protocol. That is when we would say that our protocol that is run interactively between these two parties is secure. Okay, so this is uh, uh, at a very high level, this is the definition of security that we will follow. And now moving on, let's try to build the very fast solution for 2PC that Yao had given in his uh, uh, very fast uh, research work. The fundamental approach that we will be taking to solve MPC problem is that first we take the function f that we that the parties would like to compute. Remember that this function is efficiently computable. 
and it is publicly known. Everyone, ha uh, everyone knows this function, right? All the parties who are involved in the computation, they know about the function that is to be computed. It is the inputs that we are trying to hide, not the function. The function is publicly known. So the first thing that we do before solving in PC is that we uh, find an equivalent representation of the function f in terms of a in terms of a, of a circuit. The circuit can be either Boolean or arithmetic. In the Boolean world, it will consist of and or not gets the typical digital uh, logic circuit. If it is an arithmetic circuit, it will consist of addition gate, multiplication gate, and so on and so forth. So this circuit will take uh, inputs the input, through the input rest and will evaluate a bunch of uh, gates in topological order and in the end it will assign values to the output rest. And this is the output of the computation that is uh, the, the parties wish to compute. So what we will do is we will uh, do MPC, um, uh, so MPC will, will be done via secure circuit evaluation. We will evaluate the circuit securely. And what do I mean by secure circuit evaluation? By that I mean that we will evaluate the circuit in a way that only the function output, the outputs will be known to the parties. Neither the input wells nor the in intermediate um, get output wells uh, uh, the values on those wells will be linked. Only the output of the output wells of the circuit will be, the values on the output wells of the circuit will be known to everybody. So that is what we mean by secure circuit evaluation and that is what we are going to do. So now just to give you, convince you that for every function there is a corresponding circuit representation. In fact, this is a very classical result from uh, complexity theory that says that for uh, any polynomially computable function, there is an equivalent circuit representation, be it Boolean or arithmetic, doesn't matter. So just to convince you, let me show you very quickly a Boolean circuit for uh, the function that has, that has to be computed for Yao's million years problem. So the function is nothing but greater than equal to, right? So there are two parties and they have some assets which are non-negative integers and they want to compute who is richer between them, meaning that they want to find out the greater than equal to or less than equal to, whichever you find it uh, comfortable. So this is the function that they want to compute. Right? So let's see what will be the circuit representation for greater than equal to. So the inputs to this function, um, the inputs to the function are x and y, which are L big non-negative integers. So uh, these are, you can see uh, on the screen the L bits of x as well as y. Now at the first place to build the circuit, I give you one tool. Okay, It's called one bit comparator. It takes three bits, a carry bit ci and two inputs xi and yi. And it outputs one single bit, which is ci plus 1, the so carry bit for the next level. Now, how does it work? Now, the carry out will be 1 if and only if the bit xi is strictly greater than yi, or the two bits xi and yi are same, and ci, the carry in bit, was 1. Right? So this is how we compute the output. Now it's very easy, you can take uh, this as an exercise back home and you can find out the form of CI plus 1, the carry out bit in terms of XI, CI and YI. And this is a simple formula that you will be able to arrive at. And as you can see that we are going to need a very simple circuit which would consist of 3 XOR gets right and to uh, one and get that is all so that is all is needed to represent this circuit now if i give this one bit comparator to you it's very easy to come up with a circuit representation for uh, the greater than equal to function so we have to use uh, this sub circuit for one bit comparator 
uh, L times, where L is the, remember that L is the length of the two uh, bit strings, X and Y. So this is the circuit representation for the uh, greater than equal to function. Okay, so we start, we initiate, initialize uh, the fast carry in C1 as 1, and it takes uh, X1 and Y1 as the input, that is, we started at LSB, and then bit by bit, we went ahead till the final uh, MSBs are reached, and we have got the final carry out CL plus 1. And it is very easy to see that X will be greater than or equal to 1 if and only if CL plus 1 is equal to 1. Okay? And since we know the, the circuit representation of uh, the 1-bit comparator, so you can simply replace that, replicate that L plus 1 time, and that will give you the circuit representation for uh, greater than or equal to. But you can just believe me, as I said, this is a very foundational result known from complexity theory that says that for any polynomially computable function, there is a corresponding circuit representation. And for doing multi-body computation, we will be using for Yao's protocol, we are going to use Boolean circuit representation. Okay? So we will use Boolean circuit representation. Now let's move on to the fast tool that we need for building Yao's uh, protocol. So uh, this primitive is called GABA circuit, or GC, and this is a very fundamental primitive that lends it its power to build the very fast solution for MPC. So let's consider we have a Boolean circuit C. Okay, it takes an input X, and it gives Y as the output. Now if we have to evaluate this Boolean circuit, the evaluator can simply take X and simply evaluate the Boolean circuit in a gate by gate basis uh, using some topological ordering and it can finally get the output Y. But in that process, you can see that the evaluator will get to learn the input X because it is given on clear. And apart from that, it will also learn, uh, in fact, everything. Right? All the intermediate values during the computation, everything will be linked to the evaluator. So to get MPC or 2PC, what we do is we transform this Boolean circuit to a Grubber circuit by gathering function. So we have an algorithm GB which takes the circuit and it spits out a Grubber circuit and two other information, encoding information and decoding information. Encoding information is denoted by E and the decoding information is denoted by D. Now, after transforming the, uh, the, the circuit to the Gravel circuit, we are going to encode or Gravel the clear, clear text input X to a Gravel or encoded input capital X. Okay? Using an encoding function and the encoding information. Now that the circuit is garbled and input uh, is also garbled, we are going to do, uh, we will be doing now, to um, we will evaluate the circuit in the garbled domain, taking into account the garbled circuit and the garbled input. And what we will get as an output is a garbled output. So this is, again, still the output is hidden. And to get the clear text output will be using a decoding function and decoding uh, information D and this too would translate the, the, uh, the encoded output to the clear output. Right? Now you can see that instead of uh, taking the, the past path where the input is given on clear and the output is obtained by evaluating the circuit, if we take this roundabout path where the circuit is garbled, the input is garbled, and then we evaluate the circuit in the garbled domain, get a garbled output, which is finally decoded to the output using the decoding information and, and decoding function. Okay, so we have to we have to um, uh, uh, take the second path to evaluate the circuit securely, and this is what we are going to do. So in, in um, now, to summarize, you will see that a goblin scheme will consist of these four 
simple algorithm first is the gobbling algorithm which will take a circuit if and it will give out a gobble circuit encoding information decoding information the next algorithm is an encoding function which takes a uh information and the clear test input and it gives garbled output next is the evaluate function which takes the garbled circuit garbled input gives out garbled output and lastly we have the decoding and uh, uh, function which takes the garbled output decoding information and it gives out the clear text output so in yao's game looking ahead one party so we have two parties here we have taken the simple case of two parties one party will be um, acting as a gobbler and the other party will be acting as the evaluator right and now if the evaluator is bad then uh, we will have we will demand input privacy of the gobbler right so when the evaluator is evaluating the circuit in the garbled domain using garbled input nothing about the input of the gobbler is leaked so that is called input privacy and this is something we demand from our gobbling scheme there are other properties needed for instance obviousness so if the decoding information is not given then even the output cannot be decoded back this is another property we need from the gobbling scheme and the other property we can ignore for now so privacy and obliviousness is something that we need coupling in fact primarily privacy is what we need okay so next what i'm going to do is i'm going to take a very simple circuit and i'm going to show you how a garbled circuit can be built for uh, the simple circuit okay so in other words i'm going to show you how uh, the the garbling function gb how the encoding function in and the decoding function take and the eva evaluating function eval works for the simple circuit so we'll demonstrate everything using this simple circuit so the simple circuit consists of two gates the first one is an and gate and the second one is an or gate so it takes the three inputs a b and c all are bits this is a binary or boolean circuit and after evaluating this circuit we are going to simply get one bit as output so just to take an example let's say we assign um, a value 0 to the first where a where and 1 to the second where and 0 again to the sec uh, third where then how do we evaluate this circuit on clear There's no privacy concern now. So how do you evaluate as an evaluator? You will simply take the first gate, which is an AND gate, and then you will see the input uh, where zero and one, and then you are going to invoke the truth table for that gate. It's an AND gate, so you will invoke an AND truth table, which looks like that. This. So for all the first three combinations, zero, 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 one, and one, zero. South is going to be zero, and for the last one is going to be one. Since the input combination is zero one, which is highlighted in red, we are going to output zero as the output of that gate. Now we are ready to evaluate the second second gate, which has zero zero as the input. Now the gate functionality changes. This is an all gate, so you are going to invoke an all uh, truth table, and since it's a zero zero combination, you are going to output. Zero for the output there. So this is how you are going to evaluate a circuit on clear, right? Now we are going to garble this simple circuit. Okay. Now as a part of the garbling, we are first going to garble the where, and then we are going to garble the gates. Okay. So these are the two components of 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 a circuit: where and the gates. Now to garble a gate uh, where. we are going to pick two identical looking keys okay one for zero value and the other for one value we are going to call the key associated with zero as the left key and the key associated with the uh, with one as the right key okay so this is a boolean circuit on every where can take two values and that's why we have associated two keys uh so for now we, you can assume that we have physical lock and keys 
And I'm, later I'm going to replace this physical login keys with a cryptographic uh, tool. So to gobble, a, um, uh, to gobble a where, we're going to pick two identical looking keys. So I'm going to trace on this word, identical looking. Okay, so what do I mean by identical looking? looking? I, I mean that, let us say that I have picked this uh, two keys as a gobbler, then nobody else would be able to tell apart if I give them one key, right? Uh, the, the, the person will not be able to tell apart whether it corresponds to zero or it corresponds to one. That is, with half probability it can, do, it can be a left key or with half probability it can be a right key, but uh, except the gobbler who uh, is picking these keys, nobody else will be able to uh, distinguish if a key corresponds to zero or one. And that is what I mean by identical looking and this is very, very important. So we're going to uh, repeat this exercise for everywhere in the circuit. So let, let's now do it for the second where B. Again, we pick two keys. Then we do for the output where the first gate. We do it for the, um, the, uh, the, the next where. And lastly, for the output where. So we pick two keys for everywhere. Now, given that we have gobbled the input, uh, the where's, we're now going to gobble the gate. Let's consider the first gate. Now, for gobbling, the, for gobbling a gate, we're going to need four boxes. Okay? Now, this four is not a magical number. It corresponds to the four rows uh, of the truth table. Okay? And intuitively, this, these four boxes are going to encode the truth table for that gate. And if you look at the truth table, the first two columns are, are standard, mundane columns. So they just uh, correspond to uh, all the co combination of the inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So it's the last column of that truth table which uh, has the information about the gate output. So these four values we're going to hide inside these, um, these gates. So if you look uh, carefully, what should we do really is that if we open the first box, then we should actually get zero, right, according to the truth table. So we are going to hide the, the left key of the output where of that gate. So we're going to take a copy of that key and we're going to place it inside the first box. Now the second box corresponds to the second row and that again leads to zero. And therefore, we are going to take a second copy of the left key of the output where of this gate, and we are going to place that inside the second box. And similarly, for the third box, which again is zero, so we are going to uh, keep a uh, copy of zero key. The last one corresponds to the last row of the truth table, and this is supposed to hide one, the right key of the output where of the gate. And therefore, we are going to take a copy of that and put it inside. Now. There are boxes, we have put things inside, now is the time to lock those boxes. How are we going to lock? We are going to lock using two keys corresponding to two input wares of that gate. Right? So the first box will be, so in the first box, the first box corresponds to the first row of the, uh, of the gate, of the truth table of that gate. Right? And it should be opened only via the left keys of both the wares. So we're going to use the left keys of where A and where B to lock the first box. Okay? So see the animation? The keys that are used to lock the box are, are moving. They are slightly moving. Uh, sorry, there was a noise in the background, so I, just, I had to go back and stop that. Um, okay, similarly, we, we are going to uh, log the second box, and this time we are going to use the left key from the first where and the right key from the second where, right? Because it's a zero-one combination. 
then the third box is going to be locked using the right key from the first row and the left key from the second row because this correspond to one zero input combination and in a similar way the last box will be locked using the right keys from both the rows so this is how we are going to lock the boxes so each box is therefore doubly locked two keys that are used to lock and inside the box we have uh, we have uh, uh, we have put the keys corresponding to the uh mp uh, now so we uh, yeah so in, inside the boxes we have kept the keys corresponding to the output where as per the truth table right so this is the end of it we have already gobbled the first gate and in a very similar way you can gobble the second gate as well and now forget about all the keys and the the collection of these boxes that you have uh they are actually they constitute the gobble circuit okay so if there are n number of gates in your circuit then n times 4 is going to be the number of uh, locked boxes and all this put together is going to give you a gobble circuit for that circuit okay by the way if you if you notice carefully so um, the the number of cipher the number of boxes are four because we have we are considering two input gate if you have a single input gate like not then the number of lock boxes will be just two because the size of the truth table of a not of a not gate is just two so this lock boxes together put together will uh, will be the gobble circuit right so this is how the gobbling works the gd function that i have showed you that works and now let's uh, move on and let's evaluate this gobble circuit that we have built so for evaluating the gobble circuit we have to first encode the input okay so if you see the screen of my slide the left side is dedicated for the uh, for the on peer evaluation and the right side is for the gobbled domain so this is everything is secure in this part so the left is the uh, the the the, the non private plain evaluation and the right part is actually the um, secure evaluation so let's see how we are going to encode now because for evaluating a gobble circuit we need a gobbled or encoded input corresponding to a clean text okay So let us take the same example. Let's assume that A, B, and C, these three words are given values zero, one, and zero. And let's see how we are going to encode these uh, values. So, so for the word uh, A, uh, we have given zero, and the encoding of that uh, uh, that bit is simply going to be the left key. Okay, because so that's the key that corresponds to zero. similarly the the bit that is given to the second wire is 1 and therefore we are going to give the right key and for where c we have given um, we want to evaluate on 0 and we are giving the left key to the uh, last input wire now imagine yourself as the evaluator okay and you are supposed to evaluate the gobble circuit on gobble input so i have given you this a box which is the gobble circuit for the simple circuit that we have uh, taken as an example and you are also given the encoded inputs which are nothing but this sequence of keys now remember that from these keys you cannot learn what was the actual input because because remember that i said that the pair of keys that we are selecting for everywhere they are identical looking so if i give you one key for for, for everywhere you simply cannot say to a part which uh, what is the meaning of that key that's why i needed that property of identical looking key okay so as an evaluator you will be getting this sequence of keys which are the encoded input and this bunch of lock boxes which is a double circuit so we have all the ingredient ready for evaluation so let's go on and evaluate 
So with the two keys for the first gate, you are going to try and open four boxes. Okay, and of course you can open a single uh, lock box. You cannot open the other three boxes because you will be needing the other keys and which you don't have. So for two of the other boxes, you will not have one key, and for the for the for the remaining one, you will have you will not have both the keys. You will be able to open one and only one box, a unique box. Okay. So, let's say you open that box and then you find this key inside. What are you going to do with that key? You are going to associate that key with the output where of that uh, gate. Now you have two keys for the input, uh, input where of the second gate. And with this you can go on in the same way and open one, uh, one and uh, only one box. Right? And as you can see, this, this simply corresponds to the plain text uh, uh, evaluation, the clear text evaluation, right? You open the second, you access the second uh, row of the truth table and you get zero. So this is, everything is now happening in the encoded domain. That's the only difference. That's why correctness will hold good. Okay, now you have the second, um, um, you, ha you are ready to evaluate the second gate. You have both the key input keys. You can open the first row because it corresponds to uh, zero zero input and you will associate that key to the output where and this is same as uh, uh, um, same as looking at the truth table first a uh, row of the truth table and associate z but in the encoded domain you can only see the key the output key right this is called the encoded output you are still seeing the key not the actual output how do you decrypt or decode the actual output you need the decoding information and the decoding information is nothing but a pair of keys associated with the output where. If I uh, give you, I mean you are the evaluator, if I give you the two keys corresponding to the output where, then you can uh, match with the key that you have got after evaluating the circuit and find out whether it is a left key or a right key. If it is a left key, then you know that it corresponds to zero and therefore zero is the outcome of the computation. Otherwise, you know that it's a uh, key for one. In this case, it is uh, the output is zero. Right? So this is how we do encoding, um, uh, evaluating in the uh, evaluation in the garbled domain. Using a garbled circuit on garbled, um, garbled or encoded input and finally we get encoded output and uh, which finally can be decoded using the decoding information. Okay, now this seems to be working fine, right? Because everything is uh, hidden now with the lock and keys and uh, we are getting only the function output. But there is something wrong here. Let me tell you what is wrong here in this solution. So if we give this cipher, uh, the, um, this uh, lock boxes in this order, the order in which we prepared, then it's going to leak everything. Even though you have used um, lock boxes and uh, keys, uh, that's not going to serve any purpose. Everything is going to be revealed because if you open the second box, then as an evaluator, you get to know the input combination keys correspond to 0 and 1 and the output is 0 for sure because it's a, it's a second box that you have opened and that corresponds to the sec second uh, row of the truth table. So it's very clear even though you are uh, given in terms of keys, you know that the, the first key corresponds to 0, second key, input key corresponds to uh, 1 and what you have got inside this box, box uh, after unlocking that, that's the key corresponding to 0 for the output where everything is linked. So there is a very easy solution uh, to fix this. We have to permute randomly. Okay, so all the boxes after we lock them, we're going to permute them in a random order, and that's going to destroy the uh, order of the truth table. And now, when uh, these garbled or permuted boxes are handed over to the evaluator, it has absolutely no clue which uh, box correspond to which row of the truth table, 
and uh, therefore even though in this case it uh, it opens the second box right it it has uh, it cannot tell whether uh, um, i mean it cannot tell uh, which input combination this box corresponds to it completely the, the random permutation, permutation takes care of everything okay so this is the solution working solution but this works uh, with with the with the physical locks and keys okay we have to translate this physical lock and keys in terms of crypto primitives and the crypto primitive that i'm going to use or yao used is secret or private or symmetric key encryption or SKE. This is a very, very well-known primitive that uh, almost everyone knows about it. If you, have, if you have heard about AES or DES, these are all instances of secret key encryption. Let me very briefly tell you what it is. So it has uh, three algorithms, key generation algorithm that picks, picks a key. Right? It's typically a randomized algorithm. It uh, picks a key from the key space with uniform distribution, then uh, there is an encryption algorithm which takes the key, a key and a message and it outputs a cipher text. Typically, these are randomized algorithms as well. And lastly, we have a decryption algorithm which takes the cipher text and the same key and it get, gives you back the message. Right? For correctness, what we want is that uh, if you encrypt a message under a key K, and you use the same key for decryption, then you get back the original message. Now this is important, right? To get back the, the message that is encrypted under T, you have to use the same key for encryption as well as for decryption, right? And this is why it is also called symmetric key, because decryption as well as encryption uses the same key. So the correctness uh, uh, relies on the fact that the same key is used for encryption as well as decryption. Right, so I think we can skip this, and uh, basically that is all you need: three algorithms, key generation, encryption, and decryption. That specifies a uh, secret key encryption. Now we're going to replace all the keys uh, and boxes with the keys for SKE and cipher text for the SKE. So uh, I have simple, uh, um, slightly changed the notation. So G, E, and D, G is the key generation algorithm. E is the encryption algorithm. D is the decryption algorithm appearing in the bottom of the page. And now we are simply going to pick two keys for everywhere uniformly at random. This is very, very important from the key space. So we are going to pick two keys uniformly at random for everywhere. Right, and this, by the, by, the, by, the, by the way we have sampled the keys, we have ensured that the keys are identical looking because they are drawn from the same distribution. The key, uh, a key draw, uh, um, a left key has the same distribution as the right key and therefore if I pick two keys and form a random from the key space and I give you one key out of those, you will simply be not able to tell whether it is, it is a left key or the right key. Okay, once you pick uh, the pair of keys for everywhere, the next step is to create the four lock boxes. Now those here will be replaced by four double encryption, right? So before, uh, before uh, it, it was uh, uh, doubly lock boxes, now they are double encryption. So notice that uh, the message that we are encrypting in the first three cipher texts are K03, which is the left key for the output aware of that gate. And in the last one, the message is the right key of the output aware of the gate. And then we have applied the encryption twice. First using uh, the, 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 uh, the key for the left where, input where, and, and uh, on that we apply another encryption using the key corresponding to the right input where of that gate. So it's very intuitive and this is how we create the lock boxes, the four lock bo boxes or lo uh, double, double encryption. And then we permute randomly. So remember that this is what is needed to preserve uh, the privacy. And then we get this uh, four cipher text, C1, C2, C3, and C4 after randomly permuting. 
similar uh, uh, steps are carried out for the second gate and that concludes our that concludes our gobbling okay so this bunch of four uh, double and uh, double inclusions they, they will be called as the as the gobble circuit right now how do we evaluate the gobble circuit again we have to uh, get the encoding of uh, of the input and that we can get by picking the right key the 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 proper key so if you if you want to get zero as um, if you want to give zero as the input for the first where right then you will pick the left key and so likewise for the other 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 input where so once you have two keys for the input where you will try to decrease the the four cipher text now something wrong will happen right when you use any secret key encryption then decryption will simply work for all and you will get something from all the cipher text right but you don't know which which decrypted message you should go for and that is why we can't use a plain standard typical uh, secret key encryption we have to use a secret key encryption with special correctness and what do i mean by special correctness i mean the following so if you take any two distinct keys k1 and k2 and if you use k1 for encryption and k2 for decryption then the decryption should ring a bell that error has happened you can't get anything so you get no message in this case in this way when you try to decrypt the four dub double encryption then you will get stuck in 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 three of them only one of the four uh, double uh, double encryption will be a, you will be able to open using the key pair that you have received right so this is uh, uh, something that we have to uh, ensure we have to use a key with special correctness and this is easy to get this is not a problem this is uh, very very easy to get assume that you have that primitive then i have explained you how you can get a gobble circuit for a very simple circuit now this is something that we are going to use for yaws um, two party protocol in fact this is the first primitive that we need the gobbling scheme i will need another simple very simple primitive and uh, and and uh, and which is which is the oblivious transfer i will tell you the definition of oblivious transfer we are not going to see how an oblivious transfer protocol can be obtained right we will just see the definition and with that we will go on and build the solution for you so oblivious transfer is two party primitive the sender and the receiver the sender has two messages a1 and a2 and the receiver has a bit it's called a choice bit which indicates uh, out of the two messages that the sender has which one the receiver would like to receive right so oblivious transfer will enforce that the sender can send only the chosen message of the receiver which is indicated by its by its uh, choice bit and nothing else right so the sender will So at the end of the oblivious transfer, the sender will learn nothing about the choice bit of the receiver, and the receiver will not learn about the other input of the sender which it it had not chosen to receive. Okay, so the so reason why it is called oblivious transfer because the sender is able to transfer a message even being oblivious of uh, of the exact message which has been transferred. This is why it is called oblivious transfer. In fact, this is called two out of uh, one out of two oblivious transfer because the sender has two messages and the receiver is picking one of uh, one of it. So that's why the receiver's input is a bit zero or one. If it is zero, then it picks the first message. If it is uh, one, then it picks the second message. That is it. So we need gobbling. We need oblivious transfer to build in Yao Yao's two-party protocol. 
So in Yao's two body protocol, the first party which we denote by P0 will act as a double circuit constructor. And the second party P1 is going to act as a double circuit evaluator. And together they want to compute a function. Now, now uh, here you have taken a very, very simple function which is an AND gate. Nothing other than that is an AND gate and that is all. So it takes two bits, the first bit A comes from the first party P0 and the second bit Y comes from the second party P1 and both of them would like to obtain a, a, a Z which is X times Y. Even this simple form of the function which is an AND gate has a lot of applications for instance in matchmaking. Right? So P0 and P1 let's say they are uh, romantically interested in each other and they are they wish to find out whether they are interested in each other or not. Now you can see that and actually solves the purpose. If a party P0 is interested right then it can it, it, uh, in fact if both of them are interested then the output is one and in this case they would get to know that both of them had one as the input that is both of them are interested in each other. But on the other hand, if one of them have, uh, has input zero, then that party cannot learn what is the input of the other party. So that's the security guarantee that I give. Assume P0 has zero as the input, that means uh, she is not interested in P1, right? In this case, you can see that the output of the AND gate will turn out to be one, uh, sorry, zero. And therefore, P0 will not be able to learn whether uh, the input of P1 was 0 or 1. So that's the guarantee we will give via the uh, 2PC protocol. So remember the security guarantee. So if P0 has input 0, then it will not learn about the input of P1. And similarly, if P1 had 0 as the input, then it will not learn about the input of P0. So that's why we have taken this case where every, both the parties are giving 0 and 0 as the input and the output should be 0 and from it the, those parties will not learn the input of the other party. So now let's see how Yao's two party protocol works. So the first party is the double circuit constructor. So it simply takes a circuit which in this case is simply an AND gate. It's simply uh, going to uh, gobble that circuit and recall that as a part of the doubling, we first uh, pick the keys, pair of keys for every input, and then we're going to prepare the permuted uh, double encryption, C1 to C4, right? So once the double circuit is prepared, the double circuit constructor is simply going to send the double circuit, which is nothing but this four uh, double encryption, plus the decoding information, and the decoding information is nothing but the pair of keys corresponding to the output where. And apart from this, in order to in order to evaluate to evaluate, P0 is simply going to send the key corresponding to its input. So its input is X. In this case, we have assumed that uh, it's zero. So it's simply going to pass on the left key corresponding to the uh, input where X. And that, that's all. So that these are all sent to the um, evaluator. Now is the evaluator ready to evaluate? No, because because though it has got the double circuit and the encoding information corresponding to the input of P0, it has not received the encoding information corresponding to its own input. This function of the circuit takes two inputs, right? X and Y. X is given by P0, Y is given by P1. It has got uh, a partial encoding information which is the information corresponding to X. Right? And it needs to have the encoding information corresponding to Y before it starts the evaluation. And this is where we need the oblivious transfer primitive. So this oblivious transfer and this oblivious transfer, P0, the circuit constructor, is simply going to uh, take the, uh, um, it's, it's simply going to act as a sender and input the two keys corresponding to the where uh, Y. And the, the circuit evaluator P1 is going to act as a receiver and its input is going to be Y. Right. 
So this is this is a combination. So why is zero in this case? That's why I have put zero here. And Euler's transfer is simply going to split out the right, the left key for the um, input where corresponding to P1. That is Y. And with this, that evaluator has both the encoding information corresponding to X and Y. And now it can evaluate the circuit. So it will go on and evaluate or um, uh, uh, try to decrypt the four boxes. It will be able to open just one box. And from that, it will get a key. And using the decoding information, which is also sent along with the, um, the garbage circuit, it will be able to obtain the output. So we are sending the decoding information because we want P1 to learn the output. That's why it is sent the decoding information and using that it can get the output. And P1 can simply send back the output to the, the garbage circuit constructor, uh, constructor P0 so that it also obtains the output. The goal is that both the parties receive the output. Now we can uh, analyze this protocol. So we have two cases, right? In, in uh, two-party computation, we have two cases, either P0 can be corrupt or P1 can be corrupt. And again, just to recall, uh, we are, uh, recall that we are assuming an adversary who is semi-honestly corrupt, right? So it can only listen, the, receive the information from the other honest party, and from that it will try to learn the input of the other party. That is all it is trying to do. It's not going to do anything malicious. So let us assume that P0 is corrupt. What does P0 receive? So if you want to, uh, if you want to see as a, as a corrupt P0, what can it learn? You have to look at what are the information that it receives from the other party who is honest in this case. So P1 is honest in this case and P0 is corrupt. If you look at the communication that is received by P0, you can see there is nothing apart from the output received. But that is something that P0 is allowed to learn, that's a function output. So it cannot learn anything, right? If you believe that, that this OT box leaks nothing, it, uh, the OT box is perfect, meaning that it, it doesn't leak anything about the receiver's input bit. If you believe that, then our protocol is absolutely fine. It gives privacy against a corrupt P0. This is an easy case. Now consider, let's move on to the harder, harder case, which is P1 is corrupt. So if P1 is corrupt, and now if you look at the information that it receives, that's a lot. It receives the garbage circuit, it receives decoder information, it receives a key for input X, and input X is something that we are trying to hide from P1, right? X is the input of P0, and that's something we have to hide from P1. And here again, you can see that the property of identical looking keys will come in the picture and just by looking at the key, P1 will not be able to uh, learn what the bit um, uh, X is. And as far as uh, the GAPA circuit is concerned with, we have got just one pair of keys for, a, for, the, for every, um, one key for every input where and we have evaluated the circuit. And remember the privacy property of the double circuit that says that nothing but the output will be leaked during the evaluation of the double circuit. And therefore nothing intermediate as well as the input, input, input will be, input of the other party would be leaked. And here, all, here also we have to use the security of the OT. So OT gives the, the privacy against um, P1 as well. And in this case, the privacy means that P1 should get only the key corresponding to its own input, which is zero. So it should get only the zero key, not the other key. And so it gets, gets just one key corresponding to its where. If you look at carefully, if, if, if P1 is given both the keys for its own input, it can actually do multiple evaluation of the circuit and then can learn about the input of P0. So multiple evaluation is not permitted. So this is one key feature of the garbage circuit uh, that you can evaluate it only once on one set of uh, encoded inputs. If you try to evaluate um, second time on a different um, set of encode, uh, encoding information, then 
the privacy will be leaked. So this is one time um, user's property of Gabo circuit. So that is all. So as it, so, it is, uh, so in summary, you can see that even even if uh, in this case P1 is corrupt, this is a harder case. It it will not be able to learn anything about P0's input. Okay, when P1's input is zero, if P1's input is one, right? Then it learns uh, that P P zero's input is zero, but that is something that it will learn anyway. Uh, I mean, NPC cannot prevent that from learning. Even think of uh, uh, think of a trusted third party, right? Even in that ideal world, if P one had zero as the input, uh, one as the input, and P zero has zero as the input, then from seeing the output as zero, P one will be able to imply that. Zero had zero as the input, right? So if something that can be derived from the input and output of the current party, that is allowed in MPC. But beyond that, nothing is allowed. Okay. So that is exactly what we, are, uh, we have achieved here. And uh, in general, I have just demonstrated for the very simple function of and. You can take any general function, Boolean function, and the general uh, protocol will uh, will be very similar to what I just explained. So P0 will simply take the, um, uh, make the double circuit, and it will send the double circuit and the decoding information to P1, and the key is corresponding to its own input X. And for every input bit of P1, we are going to employ an obvious transfer, right? Wherein P0 will give the corresponding keys, uh, the key pair as input, and P1 will put the the bit input as the uh, uh, input as as a receiver, and it's going to get the corresponding keys. And once it has uh, all the um, keys corresponding to all the wires of the circuit, P1 will be able to evaluate the circuit and compute the function output. And using the decoding information, it will get the clear text output and send it back to the parties. So in the end, the, both the parties will receive Z as the output, G and X and Y as the input to the protocol, and and that is security in the same way that we have done in the previous slide for the simple function of AND get, and we can claim that that uh, that if P P zero is corrupt honestly, the protocol is secure, and also if independently P one is corrupt, then also the protocol. Is secure, meaning that. So yes, yeah, so meaning is um, what I just said. I mean, repeatedly saying a few times. So if P zero the input is one, then definitely it will be able to learn about um, the, um, the input of the other party. But if P zero the input is zero, then it learns nothing about the input of P one. It could be zero. It could be one. Even after running the protocol, the same for P one, and um, and uh, that is it. And um, with that, I would like to thank all of you who attended the webinar. And I will be happy to take questions now. Yeah. So there are some questions. Let's uh, uh, put in the chat window. Uh, if you can look at those, um, I think Abbas has sent it to you on WhatsApp. You can respond to those. Okay, so there are uh, four questions. So I think I should be able to um, answer all of them. MPC uh, seems like uh, so. The, I'm, I'm reading out the question first before answering. MPC seems like uh, seems to be like blockchain consensus. I'm just eager to know what is the difference between them. Okay, so. So indeed, M um, MPC is uh, is like blockchain consensus. In fact, um, consensus is a special case of MPC. Okay, as I told you in the beginning, MPC is a holy grail problem. It's a very strong abstraction. It can abstract every problem in cryptography. So you can think of consensus as the following. So there are n parties with their own inputs. And the function that you want to compute is agreement. Okay, then you can run a general MPC protocol to solve the problem. 
Now, why we don't do it? Because that's going to lead to an inefficient solution. And because consensus is a very important problem in its own right, there are specialized solutions for, uh, uh, for consensus. And secondly, there is another difference between consensus and uh, MPC. The, the difference is very, very important. In consensus, we typically we are not uh, worried about the input privacy. The parties hold some inputs, and we are really not worried about keeping them private. Whereas in MPC, we are we care about the uh, privacy of the uh, inputs of the honest parties. We try to prevent the corrupt parties from receiving the inputs of the honest parties, and, and with that as a goal. We use uh, uh, very, very intricate primitives and uh, tools to achieve this goal. Okay, so the second question is, I move on to the second question. And, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, the question is that a clarification is needed about what is centralized adversary in the distrib distributed part parties. Okay, so what do I mean by uh, centralized adversary? This is what I mean. So I have n parties, n distinct parties. That is one thing. So when I talk about the adversary, it's a centralized entity, meaning that it can corrupt some threshold number of parties, like the T out of those n par parties. Okay, so the adversary is a separate entity who is getting, I mean, who is controlling T out of those N parties. So you can think of an alternative uh, adversary which is very, very strictly weaker than centralized adversary, which we can call as decentralized adversary, where individual parties may act as uh, corrupt parties. But the centralized adversary is strictly stronger because it is able to pull together all the bad party's information and from that it, it will try to glean information about the inputs of the honest parties. And this model is real life scenario because, because typically the corrupt parties, the bad parties are always together. They, are, they act together. Okay? So this is what is captured by a uh, centralized adversary. Okay, so let's move on to the third question. Okay, so the third question says, even random order of truth table is used. Since the truth table has zero or one values, how it helps to strengthen the algorithm? So that the, the random permutation is done to hide the order of the of the um, of the ciphertext, the doubly encrypted ciphertext. Inside that you are hiding one of the two keys, but you will be able to open only one of the four ciphertexts and learn only one of the keys. So one key take takeaway of for the your double circuit is that as an evaluator you will actually get to know one key per where. Start with the input where. For every input where you have two clock. You have got just one key. So you have got just one key for every input where. Okay? And the privacy of, of the, uh, the secret key encryption will hide the other key. Okay, so let's move on and the fourth question. How do we do encryption and decryption? How I okay the question is not clear. The encryption key and the how we no so the question the fourth question is not clear. I, I don't know, maybe you can ask him or her to retype it. I don't understand it. Okay, I move on to the fifth question. How is information secured in P0 and P1? Okay, so I think I can uh, go back to the simple example that I had given here, right? So, 
Pinsir and Priya one another two parties and they have their own input X and Y. The goal of this protocol is to hide X and Y from each other. Right? Together they want to know Z which is the end of X and Y and in the end this is learn only Z and nothing else. And Z and whatever can be derived from Z. And this is important. Z and whatever can be Z and whatever can, can be derived from the output Z. Those are out um, uh, leaking information. Okay, so if you look at this protocol, from this protocol, P1, P0 is not learning anything about Y when its input is 0. So assume P0's input is 0, X is 0. By running this protocol, it gets only the output which is 0 because P0's input is 0, so the output of the AND gate is going to be 0. And that is how it learns. It learns nothing about the input of P1, which is Y. Y could be 0 or 1. It learns nothing. If you see the look at the protocol, the information flow, it just gets the output from the evaluator, which is 0, and that's the output. It learns nothing about the input of the other party. And the case for uh, uh, Karat P1 is slightly um, it's slightly difficult to understand. So if P1 is bad and it's trying to learn the out uh, the input of P0 when its own input is zero, this is what happens. So if, if you look at again information, all the information, then you will see that it has got the gar garbage circuits, which are a bunch of double encryptions, which do not leak anything. Then it gets the decoding information, which is just a key pair for the out output where, and again, it learns nothing. Then it gets the key corresponding to X. This could potentially leak something about the input of X, but the, the fact that the keys that are picked for everywhere is identical looking. So the key that is received from P0 doesn't say anything whether X is 0 or not. And therefore, this also leaks nothing. And if you look at the other transfer, which is the left out uh, communication, even here, P0 learns only the key corresponding to its own input and nothing else. And now if you, you can reduce it to the security of the garbage circuit, which says that you, you get nothing from evaluating this garbage circuit. And that's why you will just learn that the clean output which is um, the zero and nothing else because everything is done in the encoded domain you just see a bunch of keys you are able to open one of the uh, cipher text and then you see another key but that key doesn't give you anything so you start with a bunch of keys for which you have absolutely no clue what are the corresponding bits except your own in input that's fine the, your own input you know but for the remaining keys that you have received for the input of the other party you learn nothing and then you go on and evaluate every gate and uh, for every gate you get to open just one cipher text. Inside that you get another key. You go Hello. Uh, Professor Arthur. We lost your voice. <laughs> mm. Hello? Mm, no, Karthik, I think we have lost our voice. Yeah. In meanwhile, uh, can you share the assessment uh, thing? Yeah, I think uh, there are a few more questions to be answered, but you can, yes, you can protest the assessment link. In meanwhile, I'll share so that any doubts, I think. Sure. Uh, Professor Patra, can you hear us? So she's rejoining the uh, Hello? Hello, uh, so I switched back to the computer. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. 
Yeah, so I don't know from when I was uh, lost. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll go on and answer a few more questions. So, um, the sixth question. Yeah, please. What if you use asymmetric key crypto? Crypto asymmetric key encryption. I guess that's what, what it means. Um, so you can use asymmetric key, but why would you use? Because Asymmetric key uh, um, encryption is uh, more, more cost than symmetric key. So if you can do something with symmetric key, that's the best thing uh, to use. And uh, in fact, Gavakit is um, thought to be one of the practical uh, primitive because it uses symmetric cryptography. So therefore, you can use AES, DES, all the of the selves um, secret key encryption scheme for this. That's why it is interesting, in fact. OK, so the next question is, can we use authenticated encryption in the same way? Yes, you can. You can use authenticated encryption. But we, we need that, which I uh, mentioned, is the, the special correctness. So that's something that we need. If we have that, then it is authenticated encryption of uh, secret key encryption. In fact, we don't need so strong. If uh, you are aware of um, the various security notions that we have, CPS security, CCS security. And so CPS security is good enough for, for this purpose. We don't need authenticated encryption. It's, it's, it's a very strong. CPS security is good enough. Can we use hashing of inputs for GABA? Circuit. I don't want to do that. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that means really. How how would you like to hash? <laughs> I have no clue. The last question is explain application of MPC. I think I have done it. There were many many applications that I have shown you. Let me go back to that slide very quickly. So these are the. Uh, various applications that I have given, right? So one quick example that I can repeat again is uh, computing the probability of two satellites. Oh, your screen is not visible. Uh, the, the PPT slide is not visible. Oh, why it's still? OK, let me go back. We are, we are seeing your uh, Zoho uh, window. Ah, yeah, now it's visible, yeah. It's visible? Yes. Okay. So let me explain just with one example, which is uh, computing the probability of two satellites colliding no, in the uh, space. Sorry, again back to the sorry. It's again, uh, the Zoho browser window is what is seen now, not the presentation. Okay, I think yeah, it can be understood without the slide. I don't have anything in the slide. I mean, it's just a uh, case. I, I will just read it uh, verbally. Yeah, so the problem is uh, of computing yeah, the probability. covered in the beginning as well, so that's right, fine. Right. Please carry on. Uh, yeah, so uh, think of two countries, two competing countries, India and China. Let's say they have their satellites in the space, and uh, they have a common interest that their satellites don't collide, collide but uh, they can easily find out if their satellites can collide with each other or not. If they're ready to pass on the the secret uh, trajectory of their satellites. But typically, the, the exact orbital information of the satellites are secret to the countries. And they are national secrets, so they cannot be shared with uh, rival countries. And in this situation, MPC can be used to compute the probability of the two satelliting with each other, where the countries, India and China, can provide the private orbital information as the private input to the computation. And the computation is nothing but calculating the probability. right? So this way, MPC can come in the, in the picture. In fact, two PC between two parties. And they can uh, give private input, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the private orbital information of their satellites. And they can find out what is the probability that their, their satellites collide in the space. This is one example. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, an artificial example. In fact, there are uh, companies um, in Estonia that had uh, built solution for, uh, for such things. 
in the request of uh, i mean in fact nasa had been looking for solution for this and then there are um the, there are real life softwares which uh, achieves this stuff and then other examples like tra train also because machine learning is very hot so we can do privacy preserving machine learning so think of several hospitals they hold a huge database of uh, uh, some uh, patient records. Let's say, let's say with respect to some disease. Let's say COVID nineteen, and uh, they have let's say the uh, X ray of the lungs. Okay, these uh, images can be used to train a model that can detect um, COVID nineteen. Okay, so we want to build a machine model for for prediction for predicting COVID nineteen. And now we want to access to a huge amount of data because we would like our model to be very robust. So therefore, we want to get access to as many data as possible. So now several hospitals can come together and then put together their data. And, and uh, we can run an MPC protocol where the private inputs of the, of the hospitals are nothing but the private databases, the exodus. And uh, we can run an MPC protocol. And the function here is nothing but the machine learning function. Okay. So, and then in the end, the output is nothing but the model. And here again, you can see that MPC would ensure that the data of the individual hospitals are not leaked. But yet, in the end, you get a very robust model which is trained over all the data of, uh, uh, put together, all the data of, of, of all the hospitals. So, that's another application of MPC. And there are um, many, many other applications. There are myriad applications. Yeah, I said there are no more questions. It's there's just one question which has uh, come up now. Um, if you can uh, answer that, and then we can close the session. Do you suggest the data set for building? Uh, okay, so uh, which one is the question? The last one, can you use MPC for a quantum key distribution? Is, is that the question? Oh, there's one before that as well. Uh, suggest yeah, data I set for building. Probably, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand the question at all. Okay, you can proceed to the next question then. Yeah, can we use MPC for key distribution, quantum key distribution? So let's disentangle the question. So first, key distribution. Key distribution is is a uh, is a specific task. So it's a it's a it's a function. Okay. So definitely, you can implement uh, key distribution using MPC. But again, this will be uh, not this will not be the right approach because key distribution in itself is an important problem, and there are specific solutions for doing key distribution okay so, so it solves the purpose but it will be an overkill because mpc is uh, mpc can take care of any function therefore it's a very general uh, uh, protocol and uh, therefore uh, it may lead some uh, um, loss of uh, efficiency when you to use a general purpose program for a specific problem. So key distribution is a very well studied problem. There are plenty of myriad solutions available. Theoretically, you can solve the key distribution using MPC, but I would not suggest that to do. And uh, quantum. So first of all, the entire talk that I have given the adversarial setting, I'm assuming ad adversary to be um, non-quantum. So this is a classical, classical message. So, of course, we can define MPC tolerating in qu quantum um, uh, adversary. We can definitely do that. And then progress done in the area. So, in that case, you can use the quantum safe MPC. And there are techniques for that. This was sensitive. Yeah, I think that that it. Uh, 
Um, yeah, uh, I think we will uh, close it now. Uh, so, uh, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Vasil Patra, for uh, for taking this session. Uh, I think it was uh, you know, the, the uh, application of the uh, of the uh, NPC concept. I think uh, it's very exciting. Um, I'm sure uh, all the participants uh, would have uh, uh, you know got a good amount of knowledge uh, from this. Uh, so just to uh, just a final announcement. Uh, so the assessment link is uh, uh, shared on the chat window. Uh, the assessment will keep it open for uh, about an hour uh, from now. Uh, so you know uh, those who successfully complete the assessment, which is uh, ten or more out of the fifteen questions, um, you know will uh, will be uh, providing a certificate uh, to to the participants. Uh, with that, I will we'll close the webinar now. The webinar window itself will keep it open for some time, just for those who, who would like to refer back to the assessment link. Um, thanks once again, uh, Professor Patra, and uh, hope we'll have one more uh, some more sessions later um, here. Yeah, I, I just thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to conclude with that. It's, it's, it's a very unique. Uh, Scenario because I mean if I don't get to know what are the concerns of the of the audience, it's really hard to. <laughs> I know you're probably used to a very uh, online mode, right? Where you get immediate feedback. Yeah, but I I think uh, no. So this is my first one because this semester I was not teaching and it's uh, really uncomfortable because I don't know whether they're getting or not. And typically in an online class, you just uh, resolve all the questions on the on the go. So, but anyway, this is a unique experience, and uh, I, I think uh, with the more experiences, I'll be okay. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah.